All right. So, um, yeah, let me know if there are any issues. Um, uh, but if you can hear me, okay, I'm going to start talking about uh, cache coloring. So cache coloring is, um, is a new feature for Xen to um, uh, better support real-time workloads. Um, and let me start a, to explain a bit more about the use case and why. So Xen Embedded, at least from what I see, is mostly used to consolidate different workloads on a single SOC, or to componentize, meaning splitting your application apart into several components and run them on, the, uh, on a single SOC. So the key is that these different components that you have need to be isolated. And as you uh, in the Xen community are all familiar, isolation comes with in, in many, in many uh, fashions, uh, and maybe the principal one is security, and that's maybe, maybe the top reason why people use Zen, uh, from OpenXT to QoS and others. There are other reasons, such as reliability, so that if one component crashes, uh, the other does not crash as well. Um, and that becomes particularly important in embedded when uh, it is uh, related to safety. Uh, when uh, the hypervisor is safety certified, one of the VM is safety certified, and one of the VM is not. Uh, so the one that is not safety certified definitely cannot really um, impact or affect in any way the safety uh, VM. But there is one more dimension that uh, I, we should definitely talk about, and it's um, isolation from an interference point of view, um, from a real-time and interference point of view. So you have a system where um, your user, the, the, the one deploying the system in embedded, uh, it's often owning, owning all the VMs. So there is no multi-tenancy. Like I'll, I'll make an example. There is only a very limited amount of uh, VMs running. There is no multi-tenancy. There are maybe two VMs only. Uh, you're doing mostly direct assignment of resources. And the reason is you have so few VMs, you can afford it. You, you have enough hardware resources for uh, doing direct assignment uh, to everybody. PV, driver, PV drivers, uh, they're only used in very limited fashion, maybe PV console uh, or maybe PV disk for one of the VM or two if they need to access something on the disk. But it's really not like a uh, top concern. Um, and then you have a, a bare metal application that is driving some piece of hardware with latency requirement. Now, by bare metal application, I mean a tiny, tiny application written in C and assembly to run in kernel space. It's not even a kernel. It's just something written to drive. It's just a driver with nothing else. And there is an SDK uh, part of, uh, as part of the Xilinx software tools that allows you to build a bare metal application easily um, uh, and, um, and deploy it as a Xen guest. So this bare metal application can be, do, you know, can do any sort, any sort of things. Um, but in this case, uh, typically they're uh, they're driving uh, a soft logic block with latency requirement. And by soft logic, I mean something on soft, something on the FPGA because there is so much FPGA on the board that typically, if you're using Xilinx board, you're doing so for to 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 exploit the FPGA. Um, right. So. You have a system with this bare metal application that has real-time requirement and something else. Something else that could be Linux, could be any other rich OS. So um, you want to configure it so that you know they 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 work together well. And actually, they, they do work together well. So it doesn't take that much to configure the system to have something that works uh, well, at least with the when the when the SOC is is not so not very busy. So if you use a now scheduler to get the scheduler out of the way, if you set VWFI equal native um, so that you don't trap into Xen when the, when the guest is idling. So WFI is the ARM instruction to idle. Uh, then actually, if you do measurements, it's very likely this is going to work for you. Uh, it's, not, it, it, it's, it's surprisingly uh, well performing, even from a latency point of view. And yes, you could do more complicated things, such as having CPU pools, one CPU pool with an NAND scheduler, another CPU pool with a credit, credit scheduler. But in reality, in many of these setups, they are so simple, there are so few VMs that it's not even necessary. So you can just use the NAND scheduler for, uh, for everything. Okay, so 
that brings me to the problem. Uh, so the problem is, yes, it works well when the system is not particularly under stress. The problem is um, that in many ARM SOCs, uh, including the Xilinx MP SOCs, there is a shared L2 cache across all cores and one private L1 to each core. And the shared L2 cache can be a vehicle for interference. So basically, if something is running on core number four and doing some memory operations, they might end up evicting cache lines from L2 that otherwise the application running on core number one would be using. And now it's forced to go all the way to DDR, causing significant delays, so much so they can even miss a deadline. Um, so this is something that's really not related to the hypervisor per se. It's, it's, it's down to the design of the SOC, to the design of the, of the caches. And um, it will happen on a single operating system. Uh, it will happen with any hypervisor. It's really not software it, it, it caused by the software, if you wish. But it would be nice if the software could do something to prevent it. Um, specifically, what we would like is to have Zen to uh, partition the L2 cache so that uh, the L2 cache cannot be a vehicle for interference. So how do we do that? With cache coloring. So the idea is, what if we um, dedicate a set of cache line to each VM? If each VM has its own set of cache lines, then one VM cannot really possibly affect uh, the performance of the other VM by doing mem copies. Um, so, but how do we achieve that? And the idea is if we understand how memory addresses get associated with cache lines, then we can um, allocate memory to VMs in a way to follow the pattern and make sure that always the same subset of the cache lines is given to a VM, a, set, a different set of cache lines is given to a second VM. So with smart, positioning of pages, I mean, cho smart choice of pages for memory allocation of VMs, we can end up partitioning the cache. And spoiler alert, the way to do it is basically to allocate a page every 16. And I'll explain in detail how, uh, why we, we get to this, but uh, basically you allocate page zero, page 16, and so on to one VM, page one, page 17, and so on to the second VM. Um, and so forth, as you see with the color scheme in the picture. Just checking if everything is all right, not to repeat what happened with Tamas. Looks like everything is okay, good. Um, yes, you're still broadcasting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right, how do we get to figure out the page every 16 trick? All right, the first things to do is, and this is one of the first things we did in the implementation, is to detect the waste size of the cache. It can be done via register. There is actually a register that tells you the, the waste size. It can also be done with the send command line option to override. Um, on the Xilinx Zinc MP, the waste size is 64K. 64K means order 16, 16 bits in the address. So we have 16 bits in the address to play with that correspond eventually to cache lines. Now, of course, we cannot allocate less than a page. So the pages are granularity. So we have 12 bits we have to take away. 16 minus, minus 12 give us four bits. So if you look at the color bit mask here on the slide, um, these F, these four bits are the ones that determine the color. So by simply applying this bit mask, to any memory address, you can figure out the color and the set of cache lines it corresponds to. And it also means, because we have only four bits, that there are at max 16 colors. And it also means that if there are 16 colors, there are 256 megabytes of RAM for each color, again, on the Zinc MP. And you can cal calculate it by, you know, from the top amount of RAM and divide by, six, by 16. So now we have a way from a memory address to immediately figure out its color uh, through a simple bit mask. 
We also have a way to know how many colors we have and how much memory each color corresponds to. So the next things we did is we added a new memory allocator, initially under Xen Charm, and then we moved it to common because, well, there is nothing ARM specific in the memory allocator. What, what it does is it keeps a list of pages for each color. So again, on Zinc MP, it will be 16 lists. Each list is, um, uh, it, it is a linked list of pages in, a, in ascending order of the given color. So the way it works, it's simply you ask, can you please give me, um, I don't know, two pages of, of, of color one? And the allocator goes to the list from color one and give you back two pages. You can also say, can you please give me a megabyte from color two and three? And then the allocator will pick the best pages from the list two and the list three. Yeah, so colors are 16, 16 colors. So we are numbering them from zero to 15. So the memory allocator can be used both from Xen memory as well as for domain memory. And one of the most difficult things we had to do is to also relocate Xen using colored memory. So Xen will allocate, um, uh, will relocate the text of Xen itself into memory of a given color. All right, I guess this is a interesting bit if you want to see how it, how it works. Um, how do you configure it? How do you use it? So there are a set of command line options for Xen, and those are the top one that you see on the slide. So waste size is to pass the waste size manually, but it's only optional because uh, it can be detected. It can be automatically detected. Then there is Xen colors to specify the color to use for Xen and DOM0 colors to specify the colors to use for DOM0. So note that we decided to uh, keep the color specification separate from the memory allocation for maximum flexibility. So the fact that you're giving color one to six to DOM0, it doesn't mean that automatically you are also giving one gigabyte and a half of memory to DOM0. The reason why uh, we thought to keep it separate is that this way you can play very sophisticated tricks you can just decide to share some colors between VMs and use a shared colors, for instance, to set up a shared ring between two VMs. You can reuse colors for VMs that belong to the same uh, safety uh, group of applications or VMs and workloads. So, of course, if you give color one to six to DOM0 and then want to allocate two gigabytes to DOM0, that's going to fail because the max is one gigabyte and a half. So you have to pay attention to how much memory you're gonna decide to use. Um, one color for Xen is more than enough. We actually did a lot of experiments increasing the number of colors for Xen and they don't really make any difference. Uh, so typically I just give color zero to Xen. So DOM zero less DOM use. Uh, so those are the domains that get started in parallel to DOM zero um, and the configuration is on device tree. So we simply added one more uh, parameter, device tree parameter on device tree, and uh, that's called colors. And it simply is a bit mask to specify the colors to use. In this case, it's color um, seven. Um, and then similarly, there is another new property for Excel domain, DOM use, uh, the one that gets started with Excel to specify the colors to use for your DOM use. All right, so this is where uh, things get interesting. Uh, so uh, benchmarking. So we did a lot of benchmarks. Uh, these are done by uh, the original authors, um, Marco Solieri and Luca Miccio. They're uh, in a university in Italy and they run thousands of samples for, for each uh, workload. So they're very, very detailed measurements actually. Um, for the color configuration, we gave two colors to Xen we had to we had colors to spare. Um, we we gave two colors to um, the motor control DOM U. So this is the one doing measurement, and then two colors to the stress DOM U, two colors to another stress DOM U, and two colors to the Linux stress DOM U. So in practice, for most of the measurement and most of the stress are bare metal applications. If if not said otherwise, are all bare metal applications. So tiny applications written on purpose to either do measurements or uh, cause stress. Um, you should definitely be able to reproduce these numbers, but I, I, I have to warn you that when you try to reproduce these numbers the first time, 
you're likely going to run into L1 issues, meaning that especially if you write an application on purpose to do these measurements, it's going to be very small, very tiny, doing always the same thing, and might end up always being using L1 cache, therefore hiding any L2 cache interference effects that you might have actually in a, in a real deployment that is a bit larger and does a bit more things. Um, so you want to make sure you're not ending up using the L1 cache by accident. Um, and one way, a bit crude, but effective is to clean the cache once in a while while you're on the test. Okay, so the first benchmark is about uh, motor control execution time. So there is a little bare metal application that uh, has a sample motor control execution routine, and we take the time that it takes to run it without interference and with interference. So these are the results and are the most confusing results that you'll see today um, without interference. So the, the, the y-axis is latency and is specified in nanoseconds. The first column is per metal application alone, how long it takes to run this, this routine. The second column is the per metal application as a DOM U on Xen without cache coloring. And the third column is the bare metal application on Xen with cache coloring. All these results are without interference, so they don't re they're not really that interesting. They're just here as a reference. And the reason why this is the most confusing slide that you see today is this is one of those strange cases when running something on Xen is actually faster than running it not on Xen. And uh, you know, we are all been on vir in virtualization for a while and we've seen it sometimes on other architecture too, on x86, but it's always um, interesting when that happens. But I think the interesting takeaway from this slide is that all the numbers, as you can see, are under 2050, so basically under 2000 nanoseconds. So now let's add interference. So uh, in the case of the bare metal application, there is one more process doing um, mem copies, uh, otherwise don't use doing mem copies in for Zen. Um, and as you can see, the numbers really goes up. Now, just because of a mem copy loop, your your time to run the motor control execution routine goes from under 2,000 nanoseconds to above 6,000 nanoseconds on native. And it goes to all to 7,000, around 7,000 on Zen without cache coloring. But when you cache color Zen uh, and you use cache coloring to allocate the VM, it's still below 2,000. There is barely any effect. But that's, that's not it. Let's start even more interference. We have four cores on the Zinc MP. So again, bare metal get worse. Then, without cache coloring, get worse, close to 10,000 nanoseconds. But then, with cache coloring, stay, stays the same, uh, fixed at under 3,000 nanoseconds. And we can add interference yet again. I, uh, the bare metal get worse. Um, then, without cache coloring, get worse and get between 10,000 and 12,000 nanoseconds. Then, with cache coloring, Maybe get a tiny little bit worse, but it's still below 2,000 nanoseconds, so the results are uh, barely uh, measurable. The difference is barely measurable. I have a slide to plot this bit together. Um, so the two columns on the left are Xen without cache coloring and Xen with cache coloring um, without interference. The two columns on the right are Xen without cache coloring with interference then with cache coloring, with interference. And you can see how the first and the third column, they really jump up, the difference is staggering, um, while the second and the fourth are, are basically identical. There, there is a very, very minimal difference. I have another set of benchmarks. Second set of benchmarks is about latency. So it's, it's a, the interrupt response time the time it takes to service an interrupt and is measured by me taking the time when the interrupt service routine runs and comparing it with the time when the interrupt was supposed to fire. 
the timer is a timer in programmable logic. Um, the first slide again is without interference. Now in this case, again, same setup as before. So the Y axis is latency in nanosecond, lower is better. The first column is bare metal. Second column is Xen without cache coloring. Third column is Xen with cache coloring. And now you see the Xen obviously is a bit slower than bare metal because when, you, when an interrupt arrived, First, you, you get to Zen, and then Zen injects a virtual interrupt into the guest. So the code path is longer, is normal, that is lower. Um, but let's see what happens when you in start adding interference. And as again, look at the numbers there. At the moment, they are all under 3,000 nanoseconds, and they're basically around uh, 2,500 for Zen. So we add a mem copy loop, and now Zen without cache coloring, jumps above 10,000 nanoseconds. Then with cache coloring is still below 3,000 nanoseconds. The bare metal application also get worse, actually significantly worse, but as in absolute terms to a smaller, to smaller numbers compared to, to Xen. Relative numbers actually get for, far worse than Xen. Um, yes, yeah, so we add one more mem copy loop um, then without cache coloring, again, get close to 15,000 nanoseconds. Again, we started at 3,000 nanoseconds. Now it's close to 14, 15,000 nanoseconds. Then with cache coloring enabled is at 3,000 nanoseconds. It's stable. Let's add again interference. I don't have the number for bare metal, but for Xen without cache coloring, get almost above, I mean, for some measurement, above 20,000 nanoseconds. While Xen with cache coloring enabled, it's still at 3,000 nanoseconds. Um, I'll plot all the results together. And you don't necessarily need to read all the columns, but the point is you see the high, the high results above 10,000, the three high columns, those are Xen without cache coloring when you add the mem copy loops. While the Xen with cache coloring, they are very, very low and basically completely fixed as 3,000 nanoseconds across all those measurements. All right, so the conclusion is you get a much lower execution time under stress and much lower RQ latency under stress. I think more importantly, it, it, it greatly improved determinism of the results. So the variance is far, far lower, which is really what people are looking for when um, deploying real-time um, workloads. Okay, the status is all the patches that are, are public and are on, on the Xilinx Zen 3. Upstream, upstreaming are still to start and hopefully will start soon. Um, there is another limitation currently that is Linux believes that when running as DOM0 is always one-to-one -one map and is not one-to-one -to -one map when um, with cache coloring. Because of these, there are uh, side effects. PV drivers don't quite work right. Uh, so uh, don't use PV driver if you're trying cache coloring today. But for full static partition scenarios where you statically assign everything, or obviously for something trivial like PV console, it just works fine. So the last few minutes, I want to show you a demo. That's why I'm going slightly quick. I wanted to give the time for the demo. This is live with the board is here on top of my desk. Um, I gave color zero to Xen, color one to six to DOM zero. This is just a normal yoke to build. A bare metal application for doing measurements started directly from Xen, DOM zero less, and a stress application started later on from DOM zero that, uh, that's doing mem copies. So first I'm gonna run, um, first I'm gonna run, where is it? Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so first I'm gonna run, uh, the, this is a non-colored version of Zen. This second uh, tab, it's pointing to the second UART that I directly assign to the bare metal application doing measurements and is doing measurement right now live. I started it at the time when I was doing the, I started doing the presentation. This is DOM zero. 
Now I get into DOM0. You see the nameless VM is a DOM0 less VM. I'm going to now start the one doing interference, which is another bare metal application that is simply doing mem copies. And now you see the numbers here, they jump to from 3,000 to 10,000 to 15,000 and so on. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna reboot the system, which is gonna take a little while. Just a second. I'm gonna reboot the system with uh, cache coloring enabled. While it reboots, I'm gonna show you the configuration. Just checking everything is going okay. Yeah, it's rebooting. Um, so this is the configuration. Uh, this is a U-boot script that loads all the images and, and added the tree to pass the right parameters. I gave 1, 000, uh, one gigabyte and 200 megabyte to DOM0, one VCP to DOM0, the usual parameters. Uh, Xen colors uh, equals zero, DOM zero colors one to six. The bare metal DOM U here is this is the DOM zero less DOM U um, configuration and the color parameter is here, uh, specifying color seven. I'll see if it's booting. TFTPing from my laptop right now. Um, I want to show you the, the early Xen print case. They contain all the use, useful Xen coloring information that is extremely useful to understand what's going on in the system when coloring is enabled. Okay, so here Xen is printing, this is the waist size, 64K, uh, the bit mask for the colors, the max number of colors, um, the amount of memory for each for each color, the Xen color configuration, which is color zero. So this is a bit mask. The colors given to DOM zero. Here, the color given to the uh, first DOM, uh, DOM zero less domain. Now let's go up. Here is doing measurements again on the second UART, going back to the first UART. I'm gonna start again the interference VM. As you can see, it's printing the colors of the interference VM as well. And if I go, if I print this, you see that I specified them in the configuration. And here it's still much the same. We're still under 3000 nanoseconds. Didn't change that much. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, so uh, yeah, let me know if uh, you have qu any questions. Uh, we are also out of time, but I can take a couple of questions. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the demo is that nothing happens. Yes, it's, uh, that's why, so actually my first version of the demo, I only had the version that nothing happens, but then a colleague of mine told me, if nothing happens, not really a demo, right? So I, I, I set up the system without calling first to show that there is a difference. Otherwise, it's not, it doesn't really <laughs> convey the message. Hey, Stefano, my question rolled up. Um, have you considered or are going to look at whether or not you can automatically sign the cache coloring? Automatically configure it, you mean? So automatically size or automatically sign. Sorry, I mis I misheard you. Well, uh, so the, yes. So I think the idea is that somebody that really has an understanding of the system is, su is supposed to set the colors correctly. Uh, I don't know if that is supposed to be Xen, right? I mean, we don't necessarily want to increase the um, complexity of Xen. But the idea is that somebody uh, that maybe for in, in a traditional uh, Xen server world, uh, something like a, a higher level tool stack like Zappy or an orchestration engine should be able to pick the color for you. It's not really meant uh, to be automatically, uh, I mean, automatically picked by Xen. Um, but if you're configuring the system statically, that is a very classic, a very typical situation in embedded, uh, you, um, 
uh, you definitely, I mean, should be able to also pick the color by yourself if you want to. So the benchmarks are publicly available. Um, and um, yeah, so actually I had a couple of more slides that uh, I'll, I'll take a minute from the break just to show them. So I had a couple of more slides just to show the interesting part of the benchmarks. And uh, this is the interference uh, bare metal application. And uh, when I said it's a mem copy, I was not joking. It is a mem copy. And the latency measurement application, this is the interrupt service routine. And if you look into the details, it's, being do, it's basically doing get the time now comparing to what it was supposed to be. But I can publish the source code of this. I mean, it's no problem. Stefano, uh, yeah. did, did you make any tests to see what happens if your real-time application re, uh, requires more than the size of L2 cache that it can use? Because I guess your numbers are very good as long as everything stays in the L2 cache. But no, as I long mean, as you have access to the DDR, it should fall down again, right? So uh, yes, but uh, keep in mind that you can increase. So if your application is large, you can, of course, increase the number of colors. Uh, you can always increase the number of colors um, to the point that you can give all colors except for one or two uh, to, one, um, to one application. Keep also in mind that the DDR size is, uh, it, it, it's, it's not small. It's, overall, it's one megabyte on, um, on at least on the Zinc MP. Um, but yes, so if you uh, don't fit within the number of colors you give your application and you end up going to the DDR, um, you might see uh, worse numbers. Uh, at, it also, you have to be careful when you do that because it's not that you have to get out of the L2 cache size, you have to get out of the two cache size for the specific code path doing measurements, which is yeah. actually particularly difficult. And that's why I actually had trouble in to get out of the L1 cache size, which is only 32K, because the interrupt service routine, right, likely is going to fit. So, yeah. you know, it, yeah. Uh, it's nice. It's the same kind of results than what you have when you try to measure interference between cores and you see the cache size. So you have fewer interference as long as you stay in L1 than L2 and than the DDR. So this is removing the gap between L1 and L2. It's actually very nice. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So I'll... Um... If you have any question or if you like, would like to try it, you know, the, let's, let me know and um, we can definitely arrange that. Um, and well, thank you for attending, everybody, and uh, I'll be around in the in the hallway.